This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Coveted their jobs, resented their influence, and thought them a little too big for their britches. A fault for which it seems to me, either nature or our tailors are to blame, Hay once quipped. These secretaries are young men, Brooks grumbled, and the least said of them, the better, perhaps. In demeanor and temperament, they could not have been more different. Short-tempered and dyspeptic, Nicolay cut a brooding figure to those seeking the President's time or favor. William Stoddard, an assistant secretary under their supervision, later remarked that Nicolay was decidedly German in his manner of telling men what he thought of them. People who do not like him, because they cannot use him, perhaps, say he is sour and crusty, and it is a grand good thing, then, that he is. Hay cultivated a softer image. He was, in the words of his contemporaries, a comely young man with peach-blossom face, very witty, boyish in his manner, yet deep enough, bubbling over with some brilliant speech. An instant fixture in Washington social circles, fast friend of Robert Todd Lincoln's, and favorite among Republican congressmen who haunted the White House halls, he projected a youthful dash that balanced out Nicolay's more grim bearing. Hay and Nicolay were party to the President's greatest official acts and most private moments. They were in the room when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and they were by his side at Gettysburg when he first spoke to the nation of a new birth of freedom. When he could not sleep, which, as the war progressed, was often, Lincoln walked down the corridor to their private quarters and passed the time reciting Shakespeare or mulling over the day's political and military developments. When his son Willie passed away in 1862, the first person to whom Lincoln turned was John Nicolay. When the President drew his last breath in April 1865, John Hay was by his bedside. For the rest of their lives, even as they built their own families and careers, Hay and Nicolay inspired a certain measure of wonder and awe. The greater Lincoln grew in death, the greater they grew for having known him so well and so intimately in life. Everyone wanted to know them, if only to ask what it had been like, what he had been like. It was a tough question to answer. Abraham Lincoln worked hard at being inscrutable. The tones, the gestures— the kindling eye and the mirth-provoking look defy the reporter's skill, wrote Brooks. William Herndon, Lincoln's law partner, could fairly claim to have known him as well as any man during the Springfield days. But to Herndon, the future president was the most shut-mouthed man who ever lived. He always told only enough of his plans and purpose to induce the belief that he had communicated all, observed another friend. Yet he reserved enough to have communicated nothing. Even Lincoln acknowledged as much. I am rather inclined to silence, he admitted, and whether that be wise or not, it is at least more unusual nowadays to find a man who can hold his tongue than to find one who cannot. If anyone knew the inner mind of the President, it was the two secretaries, witty and prolific letter writers, observant and incisive diarists, Hay and Nicolay left a remarkable record of Lincoln's evolution as chief executive. By their later account, they came from Illinois to Washington with him and remained at his side and in his service, separately or together, until the day of his death. We were the daily and nightly witnesses of the incidents, the anxieties, the fears, and the hopes which pervaded the executive mansion and the national capital during the war. Better than anyone else, they knew where the President was, what he was doing, and what he was thinking at almost every turn. It is little wonder that historians of the era consult Hayes and Nicolay's writings freely and frequently. But their life's work after the Civil War is a largely forgotten story. The boys, as the President affectionately called them, became Lincoln's official biographers, enjoying exclusive access to his papers, which the Lincoln family closed to the public until 1947, they undertook a 25-year mission to create a definitive and enduring historical image of their slain leader. It became the great undertaking of their lives. The culmination of these efforts, their exhaustive ten-volume biography, which was widely serialized between 1886 and 1890, 
constituted one of the most successful exercises in historical revisionism in American history. Riding against the rising currents of Southern apologia and a popular vogue for reunion.